finish the ABG handout. I think we have one page left. It's the very last page. Mm -hmm. And then I'll give you a handout about the technique for um, drawing arterial blood. Um, then we'll take a break, and then we have a lecture on regulation of breathing. It's um, you know, talking about the pons and the medulla and the brain, and how it controls breathing. Um, and just a couple of things, and then we'll be done. If you want to see your exam, you need to meet with me in my office. Um, I need to stress the importance of these exam questions, staying confidential. They can't be copied, you can't record them. It needs to be fair for the next group coming in that they haven't seen these questions and they can answer them as they're seeing them for the first time. So um, one way I can keep that under control is have you come to my office and review the test. Um, after today, I don't have the second year students. If you want to come by after class, um, I can take two at a time. Two at a time, I think now. All right, so for the last page of the ABG handout, there's three slides, so I'll just leave the light on since I'll end up turning it off and turning it on very quickly, so I'll just leave it on. Um, so it's talking about, did you have a question? Yeah, we skipped that one slide. We did? Yes. Okay. All right, it wants us to label the ABGs as being acute or chronic. So we would have to remember what acute and chronic is. Um, when a situation happens and the body hasn't had time to compensate for the alkalosis or the acidosis, we say that it's an acute problem, it just happened. And we use the word chronic when it, the body has had time to compensate for the other so looking at the first one on the left, um, the pH is 7.35, the PCO2 is 55, and the bicarb of 30. So if it's acute, we would not expect the pH to be in range. And this one is in range, so that's kind of a giveaway right there. <coughs> All right, so the pH is in normal range, and what was the primary cause of this abnormality? Was it the CO2 that of 55 or the bicarb of 30? CO2. Yeah, and the way that you knew that was? Towards the acidotic side on the Excellent, yeah. So the pH is still on the acidotic side, even though it's in range. So we know that the primary problem was going to be an acidosis. So the high CO2 is an acidosis. But now that the pH is in range, the bicarbonate has had time. So the kidneys have had time to reabsorb bicarbonate and absorb, reabsorb enough so that the level of the pH in the blood is normal. So that's a chronic blood test. Uh, the second one, the pH is 7.18, CO2 is 70, um, bicarbonate is 26. So do you think that's acute or chronic? Acute. It's acute. It's acute. And how did you know it was acute? Because it's uncompensated. Very good. And what about the blood gas on the right? 7.52 pH, the CO2 is 30, and the bicarbonate is 22. Again, it's an acute problem because the pH isn't in normal range. And what needs to be done for that to go into a normal range? 752, so it's alkalotic. Mm -hmm. So what can the body do to make it make the get more pH with more, more acid on it? Yeah. It could retain CO2 yes. or yes. It could yes. be yes. eliminate by carbon. Yeah. Yeah. Excrete by carbon. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So it was chronic, acute, acute. And then base excess we talked about. If there's a, a base excess of minus four, does, what does that indicate? That we have um, an extra amount of bicarbonate or not enough bicarbonate in the blood? Not enough. Very good, not enough bicarbonate. So it's a base deficit when it's a negative number. And then what if it's a positive number? 
What if we have a plus 10 base excess? Right, so plus 10 base excess mm -hmm. means we've got extra base in the blood. So many less base, right? I mean, it depends because, let me show you. Do we have the bicarbonate listed? Um, do you see how the base excess here is plus 6? Mm -hmm. But the pH is normal? Mm -hmm. So it's just showing you if you had, um, you have a, a bicarbonate of 30, and it's about six points away from what a normal bicarbonate level is. Mm, okay. Six okay. points higher than a normal bicarbonate. Mm. So it's not always exact. Remember I told you 24, use 24 bicarbonate as a normal bicarbonate. Mm -hmm. um, so a, if it's a plus two, then usually the, the bicarbonate is 26 and the base excess will say plus two. It doesn't always work out exactly, but that's a real good way to, to gauge what the base excess is going to be. So if the base excess is really high, does it, what's the effect? The, that means the bicarbonate is high. But then how does that affect the whole? Like if it was higher than six there, how would that throw off the interpretation or something? Yeah, I don't think it would be higher than six. Okay. Um, you know, the, the blood gas machine calculates it. And it normally is about 24 being more and it'll range from there. And then I was telling you how the um, intensivists like to use base excess as a determination as whether or not they should give sodium bicarbonate right. in the IV. So if they see a minus four or, or more negative than minus four, then they order sodium bicarbonate. So that's how that number gets used. Okay. Sometimes when you're looking at your blood gas, you'll see that both the CO2 and the bicarbonate are causing the same abnormality. Um, if you did, did you try doing your sheet that I gave you last week, and you came across that, and said, wait, that's acidotic, and that's acidotic, what's this supposed to be? Um, so one thing that we didn't discuss was that you could have a combined problem. Uh, so it can be respiratory and metabolic acidosis, or respiratory and metabolic alcoholosis. And the blood gas that it's showing um, shows a pH of 7.10. The CO2 is 50, and that's acidotic. Bicarbonate, 15, that's acidotic. So it's kind of hard to tell which one occurred first. But typically, the body can start breathing faster and blow off CO2. And that's a quick response. You know, you, you, um, the amount of acid in the blood can increase, but then the body immediately starts to breathe to try to get rid of some CO2 and balance out that acidosis. But if sedation has been given while the body's trying to do this, then the CO2s start to climb. Or if the patient is getting ready to die, then the CO2s start to climb, and the body can no longer compensate for that acidosis. So it's a, a very bleak sign, a very ominous sign, when you see a combined problem. Um, mm -hmm. Patients usually either overly sedated or um, mm -hmm. their illness is so severe that, that they're getting ready to die. Do you want to give one example? That was it, I guess. All right, so when you have a combined acid-based um, disturbance, you don't say partially compensated, uncompensated. You don't use that word at all. You just say you have a combined metabolic acidosis, um, respiratory metabolic acidosis, or combined um, respiratory metabolic alkalosis. And, and <coughs> right, so causes. Like an end stage disease, did you? Or probably right as I was talking. So end-stage disease would be a reason for a patient having this blood gas. End-stage disease. So end-stage septic shock, end-stage renal failure,
And then the other possibility would be the sedation along with metabolic acidosis. That would be another possible cause for this blood gas. Sedation along with metabolic acidosis. <clears throat> yeah, so if the patient is sedated and not, it knocks out their drive to breathe and they can't blow off more CO2 mm -hmm. to compensate for the uh, metabolic acidosis, then they end up getting a combined respiratory and metabolic acidosis. All right, and then after you assess your acid base status on your blood gas, then you assess your oxygenation status. And how do you know what's normal? Because you could draw a blood gas on a person who's 90 years old, and their PaO2 could be 60. And for them, that's normal. But if you draw a blood gas on a 10-year-old, and their PaO2 is 60, that's not normal. Because what's expected for a 10-year-old is that their PaO2 would be 100 torr. So it depends on the age. So the first bullet tells you how to figure out um, what the PaO2 should be. It tells you that the normal PaO2 decreases about 5 millimeters mercury for every 10 years of age up to 90 years. So you could start like, with a 10-year-old child having a PaO2 of 100, and then right, a 20-year-old would have a PaO2 of 95. So I used to just like make a chart. <laughs> and a couple years ago, a student who was a math major said, oh, there's a formula you could use for that. And you want to write it down? Yeah. Sure. All right, it's 100 minus, and then in parentheses on the top, age, minus 10 over 2. So age minus 10 over 2 goes in parentheses. So you figure that out first, get a number, and then 100 minus that number. Right, divided by 2 or over 2. I draw a line and put 2 at the bottom. Age minus 10 over 2, and that goes in parentheses. All right, so let's figure it out for a 30-year-old. So if somebody's 30 years old, subtract 10, you get 20. 20 divided by 2 is 10. So 100 minus 10 would be 90. So you would expect a 30-year-old to have a PaO2 of about 90. So that works. As long as you can remember the formula. If you can't, you can do it the old-fashioned way. <coughs> do 10 years old, 100. 20 years old, 95. You just keep going from there. So it tells us a normal PAO2 for a 30-year-old is 90, and normal PAO2, oh, I touched the screen by that. A normal PaO2 is 65 for an 80 year old. If we actually did that graph, would it be easier to do the ages like by one year or by twos? Where would it be a huge difference? Oh, I see. What if they're 13 years old? Yeah. Oh, that's true too. <laughs> Uh, no, would it be easier though to do it like right. use the formula now? Yeah. Then you can just round it off? Yeah. I'm just asking. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever is easier for you. All right, the next thing you need to do with oxygenation is decide if the patient has mild hypoxemia, mild hypoxemia, or severe hypoxemia. Um, and it goes by. Usually PaO2, although right here, this is the saturation for us also. So normally we know that the amount of oxygen dissolved in our blood plasma is between 80 and 100 millimeters of mercury. And when we check the O2 sat, it says here greater than 95%. But usually when you have an 80 tor, you're around 97, 98%. With mild hypoxemia, the PaO2 is between 60 and 79. 
So PaO2 is a little bit lower than normal, and that's considered mild hypoxemia. Am I? You. Do you use a short abbreviation, MI? Or, or mild hypoxemia. I just was actually like an abbreviation name you normally use like for. Um, have you heard one? In yeah, something like that. Like what? MI. Or mild, and it can hold the moderate. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah, I've never heard of that. Yeah, usually MI means myocardial mm -hmm. yeah. so. <laughs> Um Moderate hypoxemia, 40 to 59. Isn't that amazing that you can have a PO2 of 40 and that's only considered moderate hypoxemia? I would think 40 is pretty severe. So it's only severe when it's less than 40. So, this oxygen saturation would be less than 75%, and that would be arterial blood. That's pretty good. So I, I gave you the, the very first handout that I gave you was you had a classified PA to CO2. In the back of that form, there's practice. So make sure you practice with that. And go through your oxygenation, categorize it. So when it comes to the time for the exam, those are easy points. You know, you recognize the level of oxygenation and you can quickly come up with whether it's mild, or moderate, or severe hypoxemia. All right, now what if the PaO2 is greater than oxygen? Right. What's that? You said there's not really an effect of the saturation when you have levels over 100. Right, so what would the saturation level be if the PaO2 is over 100? 99, 98, 100. 100? Yeah. <laughs> now, what if the PaO2 is 200? What would the O2 saturation be? 100. <laughs> So it's possible to be over-oxygenating somebody if their O2 saturation is 100%. So usually if you're just using the pulse oximeter to titrate your O2 levels on your patient, um, you want it to be a little less than 100%, and that's when you would know that you're not over-oxygenating. So if you see 100% on the pulse ox, it's like, hey, make a recommendation to wean the oxygen a little bit. Um, it's better to see um, 90, 92 to 98%. Because at 100%, you could be over oxygenated. You want to break that down as far as greater than 104, what is that called? It's called over oxygenation. Greater than 104, over oxygenation. Can the saturation go above 100% if the patient is over oxygenated? Can it? It can go higher? How much higher can a saturation go? No. Once you get 100%, you can't go higher than 100%. Does it make sense that we'll take it for face value? <laughs> well, I mean, you can't get over oxygenated, right? But the, but the gauge is going to be higher. You can't be over oxygenated, but the gauge doesn't go higher than 100%. Okay. Is that a good way to say it? Okay. All right, so that ends this, and then I'll give you the next thing, though. Oh, no, I gave you the next thing, though. <laughs> The ABG interpretation handout number four that we got, the answers are in T2L. So ABG interpretation number four is very similar to your exam. So don't just write down the answers and say, oh, okay, or try to memorize it, try to understand it, be able to figure it out. Um, recommend the, the cause of the blood gas, and then you'll be ready for the test. So as a respiratory
for a therapist, you need to draw arterial blood, which is different than venous blood. And the difference is that an artery is deeper than a vein, and you can't um, put a, a tourniquet on and see the artery pop. So it becomes a technique of having to palpate for the artery and be able to put the needle in the artery. So you'll all become experts at it before you graduate. You'll get a lot of training in drawing blood gases, interpreting blood gases, you know, from now throughout the rest of your training. Um, when you start clinicals, you know, next year, is that next month? No, we're not December yet. <laughs> so in January, you stay away from the hospital and in the lab for the first month just to be prepared for everything in clinicals. And one of the things you do is practice your technique of drawing arterial blood. So. When you start off in the hospital, you usually start with a patient that's comatose. More for your nerves than for their nerves. <laughs> I'm a student, this is my first time ever. How long do you practice in here? Um, there's an arm, a blood gas arm, okay. and it all sinks. So you have to practice using your finger to find it. I'm going to do John's funeral. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the sheet that I gave you is going to go through some of the, the, the paperwork with what you need to know about these leg hands. So two, first thing it says is choosing a site. The artery must be close to the surface. And then you can draw a Which one did I use? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> by the ulnar artery. So what that means is if anything happens to the radial artery, which is on the side of your um, hand or your thumb, so if anything happens to the radial artery, the ulnar artery will still feed the hand with blood supply. So that's why it's considered the site of choice. It says to choose the non-dominant hand. And if somebody is right-handed, it's better to draw from their left hand in case there's any nerve damage when you draw the arterial blood. Now, nerve damage, no matter how many years you've been drawing the blood, no matter how perfect your technique, it is possible to hit the nerve because the radial nerve sometimes runs right on top of the radial artery. And you'll palpate the artery and you'll go in and you'll hit the nerve. And there's you can't see it, there's nothing you can do to avoid it. Um, so it can happen. Um, there was a lawsuit where a patient, a, yeah, a patient was a painter and went to the ER short of breath and, and a lot of the protocols in the ER is if a patient complains of shortness of breath, you draw an arterial blood sample. 
And so they drew the blood sample on the right arm, which was his painting arm, and it numbed his hand, and he couldn't get the feeling back to hold the paintbrush, so he sued, saying, why didn't you use the non-dominant hand? So it was printed up in our journal, you know, it's best to use the non-dominant hand. So I guess most people are right-handed, so it's best to draw from the left hand if they're not responsive, but you never know. It's better to ask them. Um, the next one listed is the brachial artery. The brachial artery does have some collateral circulation. So the brachial artery, you'll feel the pulse in the crook of your arm, and it's bounding, and it's large, so it's really easy to palpate. It does come pretty close to the surface, so it's a great place. If, if I'm in the ER and you guys see me and what the S is ordered, you can do a brachial stick <laughs> because the nerve doesn't run on top of the brachial artery. So the patients usually say it doesn't hurt as much to have a brachial stick done. However, it's not the site of choice because the radial artery has a better collateral circulation. And then the femoral artery, you would draw arterial blood from there um, during CPR or during severe shock. And what happens to the body during CPR is blood flow is minimal. But with compressions, you still feel a femoral artery. You'll still feel a carotid artery if the compressions are good. The patient does have blood. Sometimes they bleed out. We don't know that they had an aortic aneurysm. And they code, and we're doing compressions. And no matter how great your compressions, there's no blood flowing through the vessels anymore. So you don't feel a carotid, a femoral, or nothing. So assuming they have blood, and you're doing good compressions, you would still be able to cal um, palpate a femoral artery or a carotid artery. And next it says, it's painful due to nerves running near the vessels. So again, the nerves are different on everybody. Sometimes they run right on top of the radial artery, and you can't avoid it. And that's what gives blood gases a bad name, I guess you could say, is because people have had the experience where the nerve gets hit during the drying of the arterial blood, and they remember that pain. So the next time you come, oh, I need to draw arterial blood. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> so they remember that. If you do, if you do it from the um, brachial artery, there's no nerves there. Um, it still hurts, but the, the nerve doesn't run over the top of it seems like that would be the spot of choice. <laughs> yeah. That, doesn't it? Yeah. But there's minimal collateral circulation around it. Yeah, you, you do permanent damage. And the permanent damage would be a piece of plaque breaks off inside the vessel and it travels and then blocks the vessel um, further down. So, <coughs> um, so complications. Infection can occur, and that's why you have to be really careful with cleaning the site before you put the needle in. Um, the kits used to come, like you would get a blood gas kit, and it would have the syringe in it, the needle in it, it would have a band-aid, gauze, and then something to clean the site with. And it used to be betadine and alcohol. So you beta dine it and then wipe off the beta dine with the alcohol. And now the kids are just coming with alcohol. So just like a vigorous rub for about five seconds, not just a light brushing of the skin, but you know, rub it with the alcohol for about five seconds um, would be a better way to, to clean the area before you put the needle in. Once the needle penetrates the skin, the needle is considered dirty. And if you miss, you don't take the needle out, find another spot, and put it back in because it's contaminated. So you would get another needle if you're gonna go back into the skin to avoid the infection. Um, a hematoma can occur because it's different than when venous blood is drawn. Um, the venous vascular system isn't under as much pressure as the arterial system. The arterial system is you know, 120 millimeters mercury or higher for adults. So that's, uh, going to cause a lot more bleeding when you poke the vessel with a hole. So a lot more blood comes out. So you have to hold pressure on an arterial site much longer than you would from when you have venous blood drawn. 
<coughs> it also tells you to check bleeding time or for Coumadin administration before sticking the patient. So bleeding times is allowed, value is drawn, and that would be entered in the patient's chart or their electronic record. Um, if they're taking Coumadin, that's a blood thinner, and it prevents the blood from clotting on purpose. So if you draw arterial blood from a patient like that, you can hold the site for a few minutes, and that doesn't make a difference. You'll lift up your gauze, and it'll still be pulsating blood. And it's because, um, usually because they have an irregular heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation, where the blood sits in the atrium for a while. It doesn't go through into the ventricle very well because of a fibrillating um, atrium. And clots tend to form in there. And then, of course, it can send it up to the brain or to the rest of the body. So they're put on blood thinners if they have that heart arrhythmia. So not a good choice to have to draw a blood gas in somebody who's on blood thinners. So if that occurs, you, know, you go, you check the chart before you go stick the patient, and you see that information, then you need to stop, contact the physician, and say, you know, there are blood thinners, do you still want me to stick the patient? So it needs clarification. <coughs> Another complication is an occluded vessel. Um, there is plaque that can deposit on vessel walls, and it happens you know, as we age, we get plaque deposited on our vessel walls. And a stick with a needle can dislodge some of that plaque and cause it to travel and occlude vessels for the bound. Um, there can be loss of perfusion to the extremity, but it would be due to that traveling piece of plaque. And then nerve damage to the extremity because we may accidentally hit the radial nerve as we don't have the blood gas. All right, next on your list, it says to perform an ambulance test to check for collateral circulation. And what that is, is um, you're going to have the patient make a fist, and, and I'll explain it, and then I'll have you guys do it to each other to see if you can mimic the technique. Um, so you tell the, the patient to make a fist. When they make a fist, they're squeezing a lot of excess blood out of their hand. And then you're going to occlude the two vessels. And then when you let go, the hand looks kind of blanched. And you let go of the ulnar artery and see if it pinks up. So I need you guys to try it on each other. So let me... So make a fist and squeeze. Hold it up in the air. Do you see how I'm holding her two vessels? All right, now open your fist. I want to see if the ulnar artery perfuses the hand. Did you see a difference? You did? So that's how you squeeze the two vessels on, on one of the people sitting right near you.
So positive means you do have collateral circulation. Um, it's difficult to assess in situations with circulatory insufficiency or low blood flow to the extremity. So if somebody could just have low blood pressure, and because of the low blood pressure, their hand isn't pinking up. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with their um, ulnar artery. And you need a cooperative patient. I kind of question that. I think if you improve the blood flow on somebody who's not responsive, you're going to see their hand kind of blanch after a few seconds, and then you let go of the ulnar artery, and you should see it pink up. So it might take a little bit longer, but they don't really need to be cooperative to make that fist. Okay, next it talks about preparing your syringe, your needle, and your kit. And what size needle should you use? So 23 gauge is what you're going to use for adults if you're going to stick the radial and the brachial artery. And gauge goes opposite. So as the number goes up, the needle gets smaller. So when you stick children, you stick with a higher number of gauge. So like a 25, 26 is typical for sticking children. And then lower for adults. Now with a big vessel, like the femoral artery in adults, then you would move to an 18 or 21 gauge. Um, the barrel must be heparinized or the blood will clot. So there's different types of blood gas kits and some of them will have the liquid heparin. So when you take the, the, um, the barrel, the syringe out of the kit, you'll see something liquid in there and that's the heparin. So what you wanna do is coat the sides of the the syringe with the heparin and then squirt out the excess heparin because if you leave the heparin in there it has a different pH. It has a pH of 7.0 and when you draw the patient's blood that 7.0 pH mixes with the 7.4 of the patient's blood and drops the pH. So it gives a, you know, an abnormal pH if you leave the heparin in there. So you have to get rid of it before you stick the patient. And then other um, blood gas syringes have dry heparin in there. It looks like a little white pill almost. Tiny, tiny, tiny. And that's the heparin. And there's nothing you can do to coat the barrel with the heparin. You don't squirt anything out. It just stays in there. Okay, so if you have a syringe and you leave the heparin in there, um, there's some questions on that. So. The next bullet says the CO2 and the PO2 will approach room air values. All right, so off to the side, what is the room air value for um, CO2? Isn't it pretty much zero? Yeah. All right, so room air CO2 equals almost zero. I don't even think it's one milliliter of mercury. It's something really tiny. Um, and then PO2 of room air, write that down. Do you remember the PO2 of room air if you have a barometric pressure of 760? And 21% of it is oxygen. What is the pressure? No? 47. 47? 47? The amount of oxygen in the atmosphere? Oh, no. <laughs> Hmm, I think I'm going to make you guys figure it out. <laughs> so 21% of the atmosphere is oxygen. And if the barometric pressure is 760, what would the amount of oxygen be in the atmosphere? In, in millimeters of mercury? Anybody have a calculator? Mm -hmm. In terms of the pressure pressure, so you can do that times 0.1. So mm -hmm. it's easy times 0.4. Yeah. It says 160. Yes. Yes, yeah, so 160 torr is the pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere. So if it, the um, PO2 will approach room air values, it'll approach 160 torr if you leave the liquid heparin in there. Should I tell you right now what is that why you're doing Yeah, you would see a low pH and a high oxygen, and that would make you realize, maybe, hopefully. Mm -hmm. 
All right, the next thing that could happen is you, you hit the artery, the blood starts pumping into the syringe, and then it stops. And you get a really small sample size. Um, so you think, well, let me just see if there's enough to get into the machine. Because usually the machines require a very small amount of blood in order to um, analyze the values. So you draw a very small amount, and you put it into the machine. If you get inaccurate values, you got to go back and stick the patient because probably what happened is you didn't have enough to dilute what heparin was left in the syringe, even after you squirted it out. Um, so if you get erroneous values with a small blood sample, make the assumption that you just didn't have enough sample to get accurate values and then you have to go back and stick. I know we all hate having to go back and stick, but you also need to report accurate values. Um, syringes are available that vent the air. So you would preset the volume of blood to be obtained. I need to explain that a little bit more. I wonder if I can do a better with the picture. Syringe, and um, it'll tell you on the kit that it's a vented. I think it's called ProVent. And you leave like a space in here for the blood to come in. And then as blood comes in, then air somehow gets vented out until this is full of blood and all the air is gone. So there's that, and then the standard you start with the barrel all the way down. And then and when you hit the artery and blood starts pumping into the syringe, it pushes the this is the plunger, and this is called the barrel. So two types of syringes. One, you preset it, and it just vents the air as the blood comes in. The other one, you start with the plunger all the way in, and the blood will push the plunger up. So there's two types of blood gas syringes. So you're not pushing anything on either. Once you yeah, so once you hit the artery, you're not supposed to be pulling to get the blood to come in. It's supposed to pump in. If you're in an artery, blood will pump in to the syringe. And it just lets it. Yes. <coughs> yeah. That's with the ProVent. Yeah. And with the ProVent, um, this holds still. And as the blood comes in, air will leak. So that way you just set it where you want it, it just fills up the blood. Yes. Yeah, you have to preset this um, the plunger. <clears throat> yeah, if you leave this plunger all the way in, that wouldn't be good, because then no blood would come in. But on that one, if the blood pushes the plunger back. Yes. Yeah, so you have to look at your package. You get used to it because every hospital um, keeps the same thing. I think Broward is using the ProVent, and Memorial is using the standard. So if you're working in the same place, you just get used to doing the same thing every time. As students, you get exposed to all of these different ways. It tells you what's in that kit when you get your blood gas kit. And one of the things to keep you safe is making sure you don't stick yourself with a dirty needle. So once the needle has been into a patient's skin and it comes back out, it has the potential of carrying pathogens that could make you ill if you then accidentally stick yourself with the needle. Um, so there's a way of putting um, a protection cap on the needle 
so that as soon as it, it comes out of the patient, the needle gets covered with a cap so that you can't stick yourself. And you'll learn about that more when you have the kit with you next semester. All right, next it goes through the technique. It says to apply a local anesthetic, you can use lidocaine, and then that would numb the area before you draw the arterial blood. And it tells you how much. You use 1% lidocaine, um, you draw 0.1 to 0.2 cc's, and you inject it underneath the skin. Have you ever had a TB test where the needle just goes underneath the skin and then when the, the serum goes in, it just kind of bubbles up the skin? Mm -hmm. um, that's the same thing you do with lidocaine, is you get it, you inject it right under the skin. You don't want it go, going into a vessel. Just under the skin, and then you wait a few minutes and it numbs the skin. The only problem, it's got two problems. It doesn't numb the nerve. <laughs> so if you hit the nerve, it still hurts. You have to stick the patient twice. And lidocaine is also a vasoconstrictor. And then it makes it so much harder to actually palpate the vessel because the vessel constricts. Um, it locally gets absorbed and then it constricts the vessel. So if the patient insists that they want lidocaine before you draw the blood, then you do the lidocaine. But do you doesn't. offer it or just if they ask? I would say just if they ask. Because that's two needle sticks, still gonna hurt, and it's harder to achieve the, or, or to get the blood. There's really no benefit. Right? right. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes you feel better. Yeah, maybe it makes them feel better. Because once they have pain, then you say it's not working anymore. You just got stuck twice anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's their option. Next it says wear gloves, it's the law. And nowadays you wear gloves for everything, so it's not an issue. When I, I started in respiratory, um, what was it, 1981? I was in respiratory school. And there were no gloves in any patient's room. Gloves were not used. And today, it's so hard to imagine that. But, um, you know, over the years, it's like, oh, you have to wear gloves. Well, once I learned the technique of drawing arterial blood without gloves on, and then I put a glove on, I couldn't feel anything. <laughs> so then I would cheat, and I would tear off part of the gloves, and I could feel it. <laughs> and where was I? Somebody caught me and said, you know, do that one more time, and you're not going to have a job. Like, okay. <laughs> and then I learned. I guess when you start with a glove on, you get used to the feel, and then it's easy for you. So you guys won't have a problem. It was just me trying to adapt, doing it differently. <laughs> Um, so you definitely wear gloves. It says to place the patient's wrist or elbow on a rolled up towel to hyperextend the arm and bring the vessel closer to the surface. Um, so a rolled up pillow or whatever to extend the hand. And when it's like this, that causes the artery to be closer to the surface rather than just leaving it in the bed limb. Disinfect skin with betadine alcohol. Palpate the vessel with your pointer finger to find the strongest pulsation point. Um, remove the cap from the needle. Warn the patient before inserting the needle. Mm -hmm. um, use a 45 degree angle with the bevel up to enter the artery. All right, so I drew my bevels down in the picture. This is bevel up. So the part that sticks out first should be, let's see if this is the patient's arm. It's going into the patient's arm, so the point should be hitting the skin first. And then the blood, with the bevel up, the blood will flow in better than if the bevel is down. So bevel up. Forty-five degree angle. So here's an artery. Um, if I come in with a needle like this, is that forty-five degrees? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what about like that? Is that forty-five degrees? Mm -hmm. 
No. <laughs> like this? Yeah, yeah. That's like 45 degrees. So not straight up and angle back a little bit. And not like uh, Venus blood is being drawn where the needle kind of goes along with the arm. Um, you're not perpendicular, but then you're not just following the arm either. So that's 45 degrees. So obtain approximately two cc's of blood and then remove the needle. The arterial system is under pressure. This pressure will cause automatic filling of the blood gas syringe. If systolic blood pressure is greater than 40 millimeters of mercury, the blood should pump up without needing to aspirate. Venous blood is not under pressure, therefore vacuum containers are used. So those vials of blood that are obtained from the lab, there's a vacuum in there that sucks the blood into the vial. Not true with um, arterial blood. <coughs> if the first attempt is unsuccessful, it is feasible to withdraw the needle to the subcutaneous tissue level and redirect toward the artery. Never remove the needle from a patient and put it back in. And then handling the sample, never recap a needle, use a needle guard. Blood will consume oxygen, so the sample must be iced. And on this it says less than 10 minutes is okay. And with the plastic syringes that are being used now, there's new evidence that you can keep it off of ice for 30 minutes. So cross off your 10 and put 30. Less than 30 minutes. So if you're going around and drawing several people's blood and then going to the lab to run it, then it needs to be placed on ice because you're not going directly to the lab to run the sample. And icing it will stop the blood from consuming oxygen. Air in the arterial blood sample affects results. The PO2 will move toward the PO2 of air, and the CO2 will drop toward the CO2 of room air. Always remove air bubbles as soon as possible. Um, I'm going to draw a couple pictures with that, but let me just finish this. Understand what temperature does to the arterial blood by referring to the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. So when you're Entering a sample into the machine, you have to plug in the temperature of the patient. The length of time for an oxygen change to be accurately reflected in the blood is, it doesn't tell you. You can put 30 minutes. So let me just explain that a little bit more. You'll get orders to change a patient from a nasal cannula of six liters down to a nasal cannula of two liters and obtain an arterial blood gas 30 minutes later. So you go in the room, you make the change, you leave, and then you come back 30 minutes later and draw the blood. Um, does it really take 30 minutes for that oxygen change to be reflected? And the answer is no. Probably within 10 minutes, for most people, they will have stabilized within 10 minutes. Um, there are a few patients that have severe lung disease where they have silent areas, like not good air exchange because of their obstructed airways. So it might take them a little bit longer. So that 30 minutes is more like a safety net than it is a necessity. So if you go in there at 29 minutes, are you okay? Sure. <laughs> doesn't have to be, oh, it's not 30 minutes yet, because usually within 10 minutes, everybody has stabilized with their oxygen level. So that's what it means by diffusion capacity in normal lungs versus diseased lungs. In diseased lungs, it takes a little bit longer than 30 minutes to stay. All right, so I want to draw a couple things on the board.
All right, so I just drew a blood gas syringe, and a bubble of air was accidentally left in the syringe. And the gases are going to try to equilibrate. Remember the high pressure, the low pressure? Mm -hmm. All right, so what do you think is going to happen to this blood sample after it's been exposed to some air? What will happen to the level of oxygen, the pressure of oxygen in the blood? It is currently 100 millimeters of mercury. It comes in contact with the air. Do you think it's going to go up, or do you think it's going to go down? The level of oxygen. So in the blood, we just do the blood, it has a PO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury. And it's accidentally exposed to an air bubble that has a PO2 of room air. It's going to go up. Very because good. Because the partial pressure outside on the room air is higher than what's in the arterial, so it's going to Very good. So gases move from high pressure to low pressure. So the oxygen in this air bubble is going to diffuse into the blood and raise this number. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. All right, what's going to happen to the carbon dioxide? Zero. Yeah. Right, carbon dioxide from the blood is going to move into the air sample, right? Because it's going to want to go over the brain. Yes. So CO2 will go down, PO2 will go up. Does the picture help? Yeah. Okay. Case scenario of a patient with CVA, uh, a 70 year old female with uncontrolled hypertension was brought to the emergency department, comatose and not breathing. The paramedics had intubated her on scene and were bagging her with a resuscitation bag. And then the family story. My mom was fine until she had a very severe headache and fell to the floor. We called 911 and they rushed her to the hospital. The next time we saw her in the emergency department, she would not respond to us. What do you think happened? Stroke. Stroke? Yeah, she had a stroke, probably um, burst a blood vessel from the high hypertension. You know, high pressures in the vessels can weaken the vessels over time, and then they just blow. Um, she had a tube in her mouth, and a ventilator was breathing for her. The doctor told us she had a massive stroke and would never recover. The respiratory therapist who came in and out of her room always answered our questions with patients. We talked about what would happen if her mother was taken off life support. We were so afraid she would suffer before she died. <clears throat> when the decision was made to stop life support, the therapist let us stay with mom through the whole procedure. It was very sad, but I just want to say thank you for being there. Um, so when the decision is made that the patient is not going to be viable, um, they're not going to breathe on their own. So to end life, you basically extubate them, you turn off the ventilator, you extubate them, and they're not going to breathe. You know, if, if their brain stem has been infarcted, they're not going to breathe on their own. So within about 10 minutes, their heart will stop, and then they'll be pronounced dead. So as respiratory therapists, that's like the main part of your job, is you know, withdrawing life support to end life. Um, if you're uncomfortable with it, you can ask your supervisor to do it for you. So just because you know that is your responsibility as a respiratory therapist, if you feel uncomfortable, you do not have to actually do the extubation. You can call for the supervisor to do it. And then having the family in the room, you know, once you get comfortable, um, you know, typically, you know, the family steps out of the room, you extubate, and once you're done, then the family comes back in the room. But if it helps them with the breathing process to see it happening, you know, and to see that they're not breathing, to see the heart rate going down, it almost gives them closure to be able to experience it. So it depends on your comfort level. You know, the more comfortable you get with it, the more you can have family in the room for it. All right, so what did I want to tell you about? No, I have to turn on the Hello, again. You'll turn it on? Can you turn it on? Oh, okay. So damage to the brainstem can be from two things. 
a fluted blood vessel or a ruptured blood vessel. You want to write that down on the side of your notes? Damage to the brainstem. can be from, from an occluded blood vessel or from a ruptured blood vessel. So the occluded blood vessel is usually plaque that dislodges from the side of a vessel and travels and blocks or occludes a vessel. So that's one possible way of a stroke occurring. And then the other one is with a ruptured blood vessel where a, ves a vessel pops open and blood starts leaking into the brain tissue. When that happens, it causes lack of blood flow being delivered to that part of the brain. So that part of the brain becomes ischemic and then can die. Another thing that can happen is trauma, so a head trauma can also damage the brainstem. So a patient from a trauma can come into the ER not breathing because you know, the brainstem has been damaged. And then one more thing to write down. Um, studies to determine if brainstem is intact. Studies to determine If brainstem is intact, um, there's three things. Number one, EEG. EEG is electroencephalogram. And they're looking for um, patterns of electrical activity in the brain. If they're abnormal, that means that there's been some damage to the brain. Um, second, the response to increased CO2 in the blood. Response to increased CO2 in the blood. <coughs> Third, a cough reflex or a gag reflex. So that's, those are three ways to determine whether the brainstem is functioning. All right, what controls our rate and depth of breathing? Breathing is automatic, and it requires no conscious awareness. It is controlled in the brainstem by the medulla oblongata and the pons. It's also controlled by chemoreceptors, stretch receptors, and proprioceptors that send signals to the medulla and the pons. And then we also know that breathing can be consciously altered. So the brainstem has the medulla oblongata. Impulses are generated here and sent to the phrenic nerve and the external intercostal nerves. And this is the main stimulus for inspiration. So the medulla's got to initiate the impulse and send it to the phrenic nerve. And then where does the phrenic nerve end up? You guys remember where the phrenic nerve ends up? The diaphragm. The diaphragm. Um, impulses to the medulla are received from central and peripheral chemoreceptors, stretch receptors, proprioceptors, and higher brain centers, and we're going to go into more detail on that. The pons is located above the medulla oblongata, and it actually has two parts to it. The pneumotaxic center and the apneustic center. So the pneumotaxic center sends inhibitory messages to the inspiratory neurons of the medulla, thereby limiting the length of inspiration. And the abnustic center also sends signals to the medullary center to control inspiratory neurons. 
Um, damage to the brain stem can cause gasping respirations, known as apneustic breathing. Um, so when the pons isn't doing its thing, the medulla doesn't know when to stop the inspiration. Kind of needs the, the pons up there to tell it, okay, that's long enough inspiration. So when the pons is damaged, like you see this with trauma patients or stroke patients, where they're like gasping, like, <gasps> And their inspiration goes on and on and on, and then finally whoosh, the air comes out of their lungs, and then it starts all over again. They've got no control of how long inspiration should be. So once the pods is damaged, there's no control over the length of inspiration. So you'll see this abnormal breathing. It's called amnustic breathing. And here's a picture. Not a very good picture. Um, over here it tells you where the medulla oblongata is located. So there's little bundles of nerves, they call them the inspiratory neurons, the expiratory neurons. And then above the medulla oblongata sits the pons. And this is the pneumotaxic center and the apneustic center. Looking at the medulla, I think of it as a control tower, and I imagine that there's this big long control panel, and there's people sitting there, and they've got input coming from the body about whether they should hit the button and, and start an impulse for breathing, um, when they should stop the impulse because they're going to get the pons from above telling them what to do. So I create almost like a, a cartoon of it to help me remember. Um, the central ventilatory drive arise, arising from the medulla is modified by a variety of inputs from peripheral sensors. These sensors are located in the lungs, muscles, and joints. All right, let's talk about the receptors that are in the lung that will send a signal to the medulla. The first one is the Harry Brewer stretch reflex. So when we breathe in and our airway dilates a little bit, that um, triggers the stretch reflex in our lungs. Um, these receptors are located in smooth muscle of the large and small airways. Stretch receptors will switch off the inspiratory ramp signal and exhalation occurs. So these stretch receptors, when we breathe in, will trigger an impulse that will be sent to the medulla to say, okay, we've taken in a deep enough breath, it's time to stop inspiration. We can activate it also by taking in large tidal volumes. Another type of receptor in the airways is called irritant receptors. It's located in the epithelium of the larger conducting airways. So it sits right on the surface. Um, these receptors are stimulated by inhaled irritants, and it causes coughing, sneezing, tachypnea. It also causes bronchoconstriction and narrowing of the blocks. I guess all of this is done to prevent us from continually breathing in something the body considers uh, an unwanted stimulant or irritant. Then there's G receptors or juxtacapillary receptors. Those are located in the alveoli and they're stimulated by inflammation of the alveoli. They're stimulated by pulmonary <coughs> vascular congestion, edema. So once these juxtacapillary receptors are stimulated, it causes fast, rapid breathing. Um, the patient will feel short of breath. So that was it for the lungs. And then outside of the lungs, there's peripheral proprioceptors. Say that fast three times after having a glass of wine. <laughs> it's located in the muscles, the tendons, the joints, pain receptors, and the muscles in the skin. So 
Do you ever notice that when you climb up a flight of stairs, you start breathing fast? Mm -hmm. But that one flight of stairs wasn't enough to really raise the CO2 in your blood. So you might start thinking, well, why am I breathing faster? I just you know, went up 10 steps. And there are receptors um, in your joints and in your muscles that will trigger faster breathing. So I'd like to know why when you're in shape, you breathe less than when you're not in shape. But it doesn't have anything to do with these receptor sites. More efficient? Yeah. Your body's more efficient? So does that um, deaden these receptor sites from stimulating the increase in respiratory rate? Mm -hmm. There's probably a missing picture to the puzzle that I don't know about. All right, so those receptor sites that we talked about, the ones that are in the lungs, the ones that are outside of the lungs and in the muscles and joints, uh, it's just a matter of learning that terminology and becoming familiar with it. So where they're located, what they do. Maybe if you make up index cards and just review them a few times, then you should be all set for next week. All right, and then did you know that there's a blood gas machine inside of our bodies? <laughs> uh, well, there's chemoreceptors in the body. And the chemoreceptors can tell the level of oxygen in our blood, it can tell the level of carbon dioxide in our blood, and it can tell the pH of our blood, just like the blood gas machine does in the blood gas lab. But it's just like a little bundle of nerve tissue that specializes nerve tissue and it senses the levels. These chemoreceptors will send a signal to the medulla to stimulate or inhibit breathing. Is that it? The... There's got to be more coming. Mm -hmm. I have some questions for you to write next to this slide. What is the body's normal response to increased CO2 levels? You want to write it down so you can review it here? What is the body's normal response to increased CO2 levels? And I'll wait for you to respond. Alright, so increased respiratory rate. What is the body's response to a decreased pH? Um, oh, wait, what was, it, what was the answer for the question? Yeah. Increased respiratory rate. So that's not hyper. That's hyper. That's hyper. Hyper. Yeah, I get that, but I heard hypo and then I heard increase. Sorry, you increased. Good thing you clarified. Because mm -hmm. you have lots of CO2 that you need to get. Yeah, so why would. Why would the body cause an increase in the respiratory rate? So what is the body's response to a decreased pH? Which is... Same thing. Yeah, increased respiratory rate. Low pH, acidosis. What is the body's response? It's going to trigger more breathing. Because if you blow off CO2, you're blowing off acid. Isn't CO2 like acid in the blood? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, this talks about central chemoreceptors, and central means inside the central nervous system. So if you want to draw a little arrow from the word central, and write central, meaning central nervous system. So inside the nervous system. So central chemoreceptors are located in the medulla. They're not in direct contact with the blood, but bathed in cerebrospinal fluid. They are sensitive to carbon dioxide, but in an indirect way. There's a membrane um, that separates the medulla from the blood, and it's called the blood-brain barrier. It is impermeable to hydrogen and bicarbonate ions. 
So if the acid doesn't go across, if my carbonate doesn't go across, what goes across? Carbon dioxide. So when there's a buildup of carbon dioxide in the medulla, the carbon dioxide reacts with water and then forms the hydrogen ion. And that's what triggers the medulla to cause an increase in the respiratory rate. So CO2 can diffuse into the medulla, create hydrogen ions there, and then that will stimulate the medulla to hey, increase respiratory rate. So drawing showing the medulla at work. So in the blood, we have high CO2. Um, we have hydrogen ions, but they don't pass through the cerebral spine into the cerebral spinal fluid. Only carbon dioxide does. And then carbon dioxide combines with water, forms carbonic acid, and then that breaks apart. And it's the hydrogen ions from carbonic acid that will stimulate the medulla. So that's a lot of steps. It's probably easier in your mind just to think high CO2 in the blood will stimulate the medulla to make us breathe more. Skip all the middle steps. High CO2 in the blood will stimulate the medulla to make us breathe faster. Receptors that pay attention to the PaO2, the PCO2, the pH. It says that they're small, highly vascular structures, and they've got names the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies. So the names actually will help you know where they are. The carotid bodies are located at the bifurcation of the common carotid arteries, and the aortic bodies are located in the arch of the aorta. They respond to hypoxemia in the blood, so low PaO2, but only if the PaO2 falls below 60 millimeters of mercury. What that means is if the oxygen level in your blood falls below 60 millimeters of mercury, it will send a signal to the medulla to increase the respiratory rate. Do you understand the connection? Like if you increase the respiratory rate, you've got more opportunity to breathe in oxygen. Do you need to write anything down for that? Yeah, can you say that again? Yeah. yeah, so if the PaO2 falls below 60 milliliters of mercury, mm -hmm. it sends a signal to the medulla mm -hmm. to increase the respiratory rate. And the thought is, or the reason for it is a faster respiratory rate will bring in more oxygen into the body. Right, so if you're in an airplane and cabin pressure is lost and you're breathing this air that has very little oxygen in it, what do you think one of the first signs of your oxygen level in your blood being low would be? Like, what would you look like? Dizzy or the okay. Okay. Dizzy, pale, probably getting cyanotic. Mm -hmm. Would your respiratory rate stay the same? Mm -hmm. No. So you, one of the first things you probably notice is you start breathing faster. As your PaO2 drops below 60, it's going to cause you to start breathing faster. All right, so carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions, it says it also responds to that. But it doesn't tell us anymore. It's coming up. All right, so that last bullet will be described in number two. And here's a picture of the aortic bodies and the carotid bodies, these peripheral chemoreceptors. Um, so you see them located right at the bifurcation of the <coughs> common carotid artery. And again, here's the aorta. 
is sitting right in the aorta are the aortic ducts. Why are they called peripheral chemoreceptors? Very good. Outside the central nervous system. The stimulus degree, is it PaO2 or is it PaCO2? So in normal lungs, have you had this with Scott at all? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is a normal stimulus degree? PaCO2 controls yes. mm -hmm. So put that in the blank line, PaCO2. In normal lungs, what stimulates us to breathe is the level of carbon dioxide in our blood. Patients with chronic lung disease and many years of high CO2 in their blood, they're no longer um, breathing from their um, CO2 level, but what are they breathing from? Oxygen. Their oxygen level. It's the hypoxemia that stimulates their breathing. So hypoxemia, or low PaO2, is the stimulus for their breathing. So with chronic hypercapnia, um, why does increased PCO2s over long periods of time suppress the body's response to the PCO2? And then again, the, the little A is missing, but you guys understand that we're talking about arterial blood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it gives you the answer. Because inside the medulla, the pH is normal. The, the, um, the medulla has combined and formed extra bicarbonate, so it's sensing like a normal environment. It says the medullary chemoreceptors sense a normal pH environment and therefore do not stimulate breathing because of the CO2 levels. What's another way you could rate that? So you've got a patient with chronic lung disease that can't exhale their CO2s very well. So over the years, the CO2s start to build up because their lungs are just not doing the job that they need to do. But as CO2 builds up in the blood, the kidneys say, well, don't worry about it, we can take care of it, let's add a little bicar back into the blood and we can balance it out and our pH is normal. So it's just responding to the pH instead? Yes. Yeah. So it's like your, your body compensates, it adapts to it. It adapts to the high CO2. Isn't that because there's like a new state of equilibrium? There sure is. You've got high CO2, high bicarbonate, and a normal pH. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So with this new state of equilibrium, now the medulla is also sensing a normal pH, and it no longer sends a signal to the body to breathe faster to try to get rid of CO2. Now the level of oxygen becomes the stimulus for breathing. And only when CO, did I say it right? PaO2 becomes the stimulus for breathing? Mm -hmm. Did I say it wrong? Mm -hmm. um, so, an oxygen level less than 60 torque um, will stimulate breathing in these patients with high CO2. So the, the high CO2s, instead of that being the stimulus to breathe, it'll be um, PaO2 less than 60 will be the stimulus to breathe. And this repeats it again. But that was good that you wrote it, because it helps you to learn. A patient with a chronically high PaCO2 is stimulated to breathe due to a low PaO2. Ventilation <coughs> increases when these patients are given supplemental oxygen. Why is that? 
and it gives you the answer. It tells you that their hypoxic drive has been reduced. So now you have a high level of oxygen in their blood, and there's no stimulus for breathing. So they breathe a lot less. You might see them looking really sluggish um, because CO2 levels, when they, when they slow down their breathing, because they've got too much oxygen, they slow down their breathing, but when they slow down their breathing, now CO2 starts climbing higher and higher and higher, and then it causes them to be very lethargic and not very responsive. Um, and I've only seen it twice during all my years of treating patients with COPD and giving them treatments. Um, sometimes in the hospital, you go into a room and there won't be a compressed air outlet to deliver an nebulizer treatment. So you typically remove the nasal cannula from the oxygen flow meter and just use the flow meter to do the treatment. And so I did this on a, a patient and you know he's talking, he's complaining up a storm, giving him, give him his neck treatment. And after like the first minute, he's like, you know, his head's down. I couldn't arouse him, he wouldn't respond. Took the um, nebulizer away from him, and a couple minutes later, when his oxygen level dropped, he came around and started being his cranky self again. <laughs> uh, but I've only seen it happen twice. It's a very small percentage of COPD patients. I guess they have to really be like end stage COPD before it happens. Um, but the response at the hospital is drastic. It's like if there's a level, um, a label of COPD in the patient's medical record, usually. Everybody's afraid to give oxygen. They can be as hypoxic as anything, and they'll give them a two-liter cannula. And they're afraid they're going to stop them from breathing. But it's a very small percentage that this actually happens to. And when you're reading in the textbook, it also talks about the reason for it happening is from VQ mismatch. It says, um, VQ mismatch from the relief of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction is the reason that ventilation decreases. I don't know, when you read it and you come across it, see if it makes sense to you. But that's so the just, other argument that's The body is used to a certain level at that point, it's and it's anything it's over that is just going to throw them off totally, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they're used to having a little level of oxygen, and too much throws it off. Mm -hmm. so it just shows that it's yeah. What is the effect of carbon dioxide on cerebral blood flow? Mm -hmm. High CO2 levels dilate cerebral blood vessels. And this increases the normal blood flow to the brain. Low levels of arterial carbon dioxide constrict the flow of blood to the brain. All right, so high CO2, you've got dilated cerebral blood vessels. Not much of a concern respiratory wise. Probably gives the patient a headache. They're not feeling so great when their CO2s are high. Um, low levels of arterial CO2 constrict cerebral blood vessels. And Respiratory used to be involved a lot with um, patients that have head trauma or brain surgery, and they come out, and then when you put them on a ventilator, usually the surgeon or the, the, the trauma intensivist would tell you, hyperventilate the patient, we want to get the CO2s really low, um, we want to constrict the blood flow going to the brain. So you have to you know, either increase the respiratory rate on the ventilator, the tidal volume, get a blood gas, check it, see if you got your CO2 is low enough. And then, over the years, they realized, well, the neuro outcome from doing this to a patient worsens their outcome. So they don't recover neurologically when they're better, as if a good blood flow to the brain was allowed. So then they stopped doing it. So you shouldn't see it anymore. Sometimes you come across um, some questions on your national exam. You've got a trauma, a head trauma, what should you do ventilator-wise, but for the most part they're finding that it's not a good idea to do it. 
and then compare the effect of carbon dioxide on the brain to the effect of carbon dioxide on pulmonary muscles. I think I might even be discussing this when we review next week, but um, high CO2s will constrict the pulmonary blood vessels, but it dilates cerebral blood vessels. So it has like an opposite effect. Same thing with um, low CO2. Low CO2 constricts cerebral blood vessels, but dilates pulmonary vessels. So they're, they're opposites. So wouldn't that be a good test question? No. no. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you want to be checked. Right? <laughs> what is the effect of CO2 on pulmonary blood vessels and cerebral blood vessels? Yeah. What, you can make it an essay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Make it an essay? <laughs> John likes it. All right. Do you guys want to take a break? Because we have one, two, three. We have four pages left. You want to keep going? Power through it? All right. All right. This is actually a review from what we had at the beginning of the semester. <laughs> What causes air to enter the lungs? Well, inspiration is initiated when the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles contract. The thoracic cage increases in size, and this creates a negative pressure or a subatmospheric pressure in the lungs. Air enters the lungs because pressure in the lungs is less than atmospheric pressure. This is an essay question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay? You'll get it this time? <laughs> when alveolar pressure is less than only on the third test. When alveolar pressure is less than pressure at the mouth, air flows into the lung. When alveolar pressure reaches zero, flow stops. The diaphragm and intercostal muscles relax which causes the lungs to recoil. The lungs recoil, <coughs> which increases pressure in the alveoli. The increased pressure causes air to flow out of the lungs. It all makes sense now, doesn't it? <coughs> what keeps lungs expanded and never collapsed? It tells you that pleural pressure is always more negative than alveolar pressure. And you have to know that for the quiz, the online quiz. So, it's possible to measure what the pressures are in the alveoli um, by putting in an esophageal catheter. And when it sits right below the diaphragm, it can sense the changes in pressure of the diaphragm in the thoracic cage. Esophageal pressure monitor. You don't need to know that. That's not a test question. Very sure. <laughs> um, I'm going to draw a picture.
right, so looking at that picture, what happens with a penetrating wound that exposes the pleural space to the atmosphere? All right, so normally we have this is intact, and the negative pleural pressure pulls on the lungs and keeps them expanded. What if there's a hole in the thorax? And this negative pressure is no longer negative, but becomes atmospheric pressure. What do you think would happen to the lungs? They would collapse. So that negative pleural pressure actually pulls on the lungs and keeps them expanded. And when you lose, pardon me, when you lose your negative pleural pressure, the lungs collapse. So penetrating chest wound. So a stab wound, gunshot wound, trauma, you know, falling and then somehow opening that up, then the lungs would collapse. If there's a hole in the in the chest wall. pressure to pull the air through those constricted airways. Anybody who has had asthma can definitely understand that feeling. It takes a lot of effort to pull air into the lungs. Hmm. All right, so now we get into lung volumes and we're done. So to discuss lung volumes, this chart is really great, and I would recommend that once you get your test, you draw this box on your test, give it four columns, and fill in each column before you answer the questions um, about the different lung volumes. Um, what this shows is, I'll explain it and then we'll go through it in the notes. All right, so total lung capacity is all the air that's possible in your lungs. So when you take the deepest breath possible, it's you use the saying that you are at total lung capacity, meaning that's the maximum amount of air that your lungs can hold, total lung capacity. And that's broken up into four different volumes. So let's start with your tidal volume, the air that you breathe in and out of the lung. That's considered your tidal volume. Um, but when you breathe in your tidal volume, you could still pull in more air into your lungs. And that's called your inspiratory reserve volume. So you breathe in your normal tidal volume and all the extra air that you can pack into your lungs, inspiratory reserve volume. Then you exhale. And when you're done exhaling, there's still air that's in your lungs. And you could exhale that extra air by pushing it out. That's called your expiratory reserve volume. So after a normal exhalation, all that extra air you can push out of your lungs, expiratory reserve volume. And then you push and push and push and push until you can't push out any more air. 
And when you're done pushing all the air out of your lungs, there's still air left in your lungs that you can't exhale, and that's called your residual volume. And that's a volume. And then there's different combinations, and we'll go through that in the notes. Up here, it shows the same thing. It shows a tidal volume. Um, you breathe in, you breathe out, just a normal tidal volume is about 500 mLs. Um, when, after you breathe in, all that extra air you can breathe in is called your inspiratory reserve volume. It's about 3,100 mLs of air that you can pull in extra. At that point, your lungs are as full of air as they can possibly get. And when you exhale and blow it all the way out, it's called a vital capacity. That includes three things, and we have it in our notes coming up. So that's a chart. But it, it's this, the four columns that I would recommend that you, put, that you memorize and put in the chart. Okay, so lung volumes. There are four volumes and four capacities. A capacity is a combination of two or more volumes. And a volume is a single entity which does not overlap another. The tidal volume is the amount of air that is inhaled and exhaled each breath while at rest. The inspiratory reserve volume is the maximal amount of air that is inspired after a normal inspiration. The expiratory reserve volume is the maximal amount of air that is exhaled after a normal exhalation. And the residual volume is the amount of air that remains in the lungs after a complete exhalation. It cannot be exhaled. All right, now to combine the volumes into capacities. The first one is the inspiratory capacity. This is the maximal amount of air inhaled after a normal exhalation. So it includes the tidal volume, plus the inspiratory reserve volume. And when you're practicing in spirometry with the patients, you've done that in the lab. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so you say, exhale normally, and take a deep breath in, pull in it as deep as you can. They're pulling in their tidal volume, they're pulling in their inspiratory reserve volume. So that's called the inspiratory capacity, is what you're encouraging. All right, another big one in respiratory care is the functional residual capacity, and that's the air left in the lungs after a normal exhalation. So functional residual capacity includes two volumes. It includes the uh, expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume. And in patients that have really bad obstructive airways, that FRC increases a lot. They usually have a big chest because their FRC is so new. So the the COPD. Yes. Yeah, increase with COPD. And the next capacity is called vital capacity. This is the maximal exhalation after a maximal inhalation. And you perform a vital capacity when you do a pulmonary function test with the patients. And we'll give them that in this one. Vital capacity. And by having a patient perform a vital capacity, you can tell a lot about their lungs. If they're able to get all the air out really quickly, then they have normal airways. But if they blow and they, it takes a long time for the air to come out, then they have obstructed airways. So that's how you use, you use it for diagnosing COPD. And then total lung capacity is the total amount of air in the lungs. It is measured at maximal inspiration. It includes the residual volume. So this is another value that you mentioned that you measure during a pulmonary function test. Mm -hmm. All right. So you take your test. And you're given a capacity and you're given a volume. You have to solve for that other volume. 
Can you give me an example? Yes. yes. is 3,500 mLs. So you would have to remember that the inspiratory capacity includes two volumes. It includes tidal volume and it includes the inspiratory reserve volume. So I gave you the tidal volume and you have to find what the inspiratory reserve volume is. What would you do? Yeah, to subtract it. Yes, 3,000 mLs. is the expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume. Mm -hmm. And you would add those two numbers together to find out the answer. What about this one? What is the vital capacity? <coughs> It's been written like that forever. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I could throw it off a little bit. How about if I do that? Yeah. Um, right, so if I give you more values than you need, you would have to realize that vital capacity is just the tidal volume, the inspiratory reserve volume, the expiratory reserve volume. And you would add those three together, and you would ignore that the, reserve, the residual volume is listed there. You guys ready for a nice Thanksgiving weekend? <laughs> <laughs> Not until you graduate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, the college is closed for um, the rest of the week, so we won't be getting together on Friday. Um, if 
there's any phone calls you want to make to me on Monday, sending emails, texts, whatever, to clarify any of the information that we covered, please do so. Tuesday after the test. Oh,